Hey guys, this is Sarah and welcome back to my channel. So today is Vlogmas Day 11, I believe. If I'm not forgetting, I could be mistaken. And yesterday I was kind of feeling a little bit down about booktube and life and whatnot. So I asked you guys for some ideas of videos that I could film and one of my kind, very long time subscribers, Azalea, Hello Azalea. <laughs> um, she recommended that I maybe try, amongst other things, which I'm going to do actually as well, but um, the time and place tag. And I believe the time and place tag was started by Jen Campbell. I'm not 100% sure on that. I'll do some more in some more thorough research uh, before I post this, hopefully. And basically the time and place tag is you choose 10 books and you kind of talk about when you bought them, like what you were doing, and then why you bought them. And so I have actually 11, but pardon me, two of mine are like kids books. <laughs> so I figured it would be okay that I have 11 and I will give you a brief explanation of the story behind each of these books. And I was worried at first about doing this tag because I thought about it and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, most of my books are in storage, even though, yeah, I have a zero TBR thing that I want to do in the next upcoming months. But however, still, I have like more than like 10 book boxes full of books in storage. But Strangely, I did bring a lot of some of my childhood favorites and then a lot, all my poetry is here because I don't leave my poetry in stock. <laughs> Anywho, so let's get into it. The first book is one that my grandmother got me. We were in Super U, which is a French grocery store, supermarket, kind of like if you're in the South of the US. Um, they have Publixes uh, in the north. I mean, do they have Publixes in the north? In the west, they don't. They have like other chains like uh, Smith's or Kruger's or whatever. Anyway, but it's a grocery store. And she would always get me um, either a graphic novel or a like book. And this was before I could read French really well. And so she had gotten me wee oui, wee. Oui, Et le cheval de bois. Um, it's just the story of this little um, gnome guy, Wee oui, Wee, oui, and he has a bunch of adventures. And this is his adventure with the horse made out of wood. I believe these weren't originally in French. I think they're like translated works. But I always really liked Wee oui, Wee. Oui. He's such an optimistic little like character, always trying to like put his best foot forward and I always like the illustration style as well there's one with like Wee Wee's little like beagle dog and that was like my favorite thing when I was little so and here's the Cheval de Bois so yeah so that was that first one I know it's like short and sweet but like really that's what I have but it just reminds me of how my grandmother used to spoil me rotten and take me to the grocery store and buy me like a book. I have like a bunch of stuff ones. And yeah, so that that was sweet. And then the other kids book that I have is this Give a Dog a Bone Stories, Poems, Jokes, and Riddles about Dogs. And the story behind this is I had gone to my pediatric doctor when I was like maybe seven years old and I must have had a bunch of tests done or something but I came out of the doctor's appointment with this like band on that looked very much like a hospital band that they used to have people wear. I'm not sure if they still do in the States. And straight after that we went to this like I guess like fair thing that they were having at one of the parks next to my school and a lot of the people thought I was like just getting out of hospital and so they were all really kind to me but it also was making me really nervous and I kept on trying to be like no I just went to the doctor I'm fine but so of course my first point of like refuge and to like calm myself down is books and I don't know if I was like really sick because I just remember things being kind of like really blurry. Anywho, I got this book and this became like one of my favorite, favorite books. I just read this over and over and over again and it has like these really 
cute <laughs> drawings and it's all about dogs. I always was fixated on dogs anyway when I was little, especially before getting my, my princess sheepy. Um, I just was all about this and it's just like everything themed about dogs is poem stories. I don't know, <laughs> but this was like one of my favorite books. I, I don't even know if this is still in print, but I think I brought this with me because I'm like so attached to it that I did not, I could not stand putting it into storage. And so, and there's longer fiction, well for kids, longer fiction as well. So yeah, that's, that's one of the other ones. I should reread this. Tick, talk, woof, jokes and riddles. Guys, guys, hold on. We gotta try one of this. These are pretty corny. Why does a watchdog run around in circles to wind himself up? up? What animal goes tick tock woof a watchdog? <laughs> Clearly my sense of humor hasn't changed. I'm such a child. Okay. Then I want to talk, I'm trying to go in sequential order here, so we're gonna try our best. Then I have a poetry collection, uh, Poems New and Collected by, I should have looked this up, I should know how to say her name by now because I've read her, Wistawa Simborska. The story behind this is my high school best best friend and soul with S-O-L-E mate, Oriana. And I met, like we had been talking at school, but we like met to hang out for, for the first time outside of school for real in Barnes and Nobles. And for some reason we decided to go to the poetry section. I don't really remember why. I think it's because we were like in creative writing together. So we're gonna get some inspiration. And this is the book that we picked up at the Barnes and Nobles. And we did this thing where, and I still do this to this day as you guys know, where we just opened on a random poem and we read it to one another and that was like the poem of the moment type of deal and this is like the first collection of poetry that I bought because of that because I was having such a good time. I wish I could remember the exact poem that I opened up on when I was talking with her. But yeah, so that's the story of this collection of poetry. He's not my favorite poet by far, but I still like, I'm so fond of this like collection because of that and of those memories because so many days afterwards we would just open and we'd read and kind of interpret about how it suited the moment. <laughs> uh, another book that I read around the same time was Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. And I bought this book for a class and it was this class that ruined most of the books that I read during the length of this class because on every single page we had to place a post-it summarizing that page. And I'm a really thorough person <laughs> so like I would write like I, I bought like these post-its. There's post-its that are longer than regular post-its. And I bought those to write on these books. And A, I love this to a point where like I still liked the text in spite of having to write a, pull, a full post-it note on each page. But then as an adult, because my post-it notes were pretty ridiculous, I like took them out like one by one. I read the post-it notes at the time. I don't know, I think I just recycled them because they didn't have any like, to me, worthwhile thoughts. So yeah, I still need to reread Their Eyes Were Watching God because I don't think I've ever reread it since that point, but I remember really, really loving it. And this is a beautiful copy as well, so yeah. I also remember being like really, this was the first book that I read that took place in Florida and I was from Florida, so it was really meaningful. Let's see. Oh, I should have talked about this one right after that dog uh, picture book that I mentioned. This is The Blue Angel by Francine Prose. And I read this, I think my last year of middle school. I don't know how old one is in middle school, but it was like definitely before I, maybe it was before that. I think I was like 12. Yeah, I was probably 12 when I read this. And 
this is kind of like a, a retelling of Louita. Anyway, when I was young, my parents just let me wander through the bookstore and I could choose whatever I wanted to read. So sometimes I ended up reading things that like some people might not consider age appropriate. The original book I wanted to show you guys was um, Edinburgh by Alexander um, G, I believe. He's the one who wrote the um, Night Queen, I think is what it's called. The opera singer. Uh, long novel that I really liked. Anyway, this book is like a Lolita retelling. Edinburgh deals with a boy who is part of a chorus group and there is a lot of turmoil in his class because their chorus professor is accused of um, pedophilia and it follows like all their psychologies and stuff. And anyway, so you can tell from a young age, trauma narratives were my jam. And I haven't reread this since then, and I know that a lot of it went over my head because I remember being very confused. Especially let me read you the back because I don't even know if it's like a, a like, I don't know how I feel about it in retrospect. It's been years since Swen Swenson, a professor in a New England creative writing pro Graham has published a novel. It's been even longer since any of his students have shown promise. Enter Angelina Argo, a pierced tattooed student with rare talent for writing. Angelina is just the thing Swinson needs, and better yet, she wants his help. But as we all know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Deliciously escaped, Blue Angel is a weathering take on today's academic mores and a scathing tale that shows what can happen when academic politics collides with political correctness. So, already, like, I know that 90% of that went over my head at the time. But yeah, I'm interested in rereading this, and I'm even more interested in rereading Edinburgh. Uh, and I saw it at my library, so it might be one of those three books that I allow myself to read. Because my copy is in storage somewhere. I thought I brought it but over here, but I did not. <laughs> Silly me. All right, the next book, my mom's friend gave this to me again at a ridiculously young age. I think I was like, I wasn't in high school yet, so I don't know why she gave me this. <laughs> I mean, I was always a prolific reader, but like, wait until you see what I'm about to hold up because it's not something you give to a middle schooler. Anna Kernan, you know, not a lot intimidating to be given this as like a young child. I remember reading like the first sentence and being like, no. And I don't know why, because like actually as an adult, the first sentence intrigues me quite a bit. You know, the happy families quote thing. But the reason I have yet to read this is because I keep on trying to figure out what translation I should read. Cause you know, like apparently it makes a huge difference what translation you read and you know, I want to read the right translation. I want to get the full picture. I'm sure it's never going to be, you know, as good as reading it in Russian. This one's, uh, this one's by Constance Garnett. This book is from 1997. I'm sure that I was given to it afterwards because I would have been very small, but 1997. This is probably my, like, one of my, like, longest owned adult fiction books. <laughs> But I bet one day I'll read this. <laughs> uh, maybe it's part of my zero TBR. Okay, see? See, guys? Logic. It happens. <clears throat> we need some water. All right. The next thing is going to be slightly... No, I'm going to go with the less scandalous option. So the next book is the first book that I purchased at my um, FSU bookstore because I needed a book and was missing reading regular books and did not feel like taking the bus at that time out to the borders because I had, I think it was like shortly after me getting quite lost for a while <laughs> with the bus systems. Luckily the bus drivers were super kind, which, you know, if not, I would have never found my way back on campus. <laughs> But anyway, I saw at the bookstore An Unquiet Mind by Kay Redfield Jamison. I recently talked about this in my five memoirs recommendation and it had a profound effect on me. I really loved it and then sort of went on to recommend it to all my friends and even acquaintances, one of which really, really loved it as well. So not that the others didn't, but that one I know for sure read it. 
So that's that one. I just remember being there in the stacks and like all the school books were like in the back of the bookstore and like next to the magazines they had like two shelves worth of books and somehow this one was on there. Probably thanks to some psych uh, professor or something, who knows. And then now we go into the scandalous thing. <laughs> bought it off of a library, but I purposefully kept a library book from FSU. <laughs> I lost it. I probably could get in trouble for that, but I paid for it. So, but anyway, you can see the little FSU stare. <laughs> uh, and I purposefully got a book of poetry, uh, André Breton book of poetry. Um, this one's Poems of André Breton, a bilingual anthology. And because at the time I was like really into surrealists and like one of my poetry professors for the like few creative writing classes I took in college told me I was a surrealist. So, you know, even the surrealists hated women. So <laughs> good grief, Charlie Brown. But anyway, I got this because I wanted a book from the library. I feel kind of bad in retrospect because I feel like this book is kind of irreplaceable because it's a first edition from 1982 <laughs> but, and it got purchased in 1982 and it probably took it from the library in 2007. <laughs> I paid like 50 bucks for it. I'm crazy. Anyway, priorities are completely skewed. And the next poetry collection that I want to talk to you about is one that I found with my then person, Stephen, and it was in a bookstore in Boca. Um, I forget the name of the bookstore. I had a bunch of like really cool older books, and they had a super duper um, poetry section. And this is the later poems of Williams Carlos Williams in this New Direction slipcase. And Stephen had looked at it for quite some time but never purchased it. And at the time I had not read any Williams Carlos Williams. And I opted to get it. And that was a happy surprise for many reasons, which I will leave unsaid. But yeah, that was one of my happy moments. Um, and I quite, quite like this. And yeah, it's, it's a cool book. <laughs> I love that I'm not like telling you guys why. <laughs> I was gonna leave it at that. <laughs> Let my giggles speak. Anywho. And then I wanted to talk about two of my time and place selections that I got in New York City because my partner Caitlin lived in New York City for two years and I got to visit the city three times which is not enough to see everything but I did get to go to two pretty awesome bookstores. I went to more than two but the books that I'm telling you about are from these specific two bookstores. The first is a collection of poems. It's the first collection of poems that I bought for myself. I believe it's the first. It may not be the first, but it's one of my favorite authors, so I'm going to choose to talk about him. Um, from The Strand, and it is The Emperor of Water Clock by Yusuf Kominyaka. And um, he's just an awesome poet, thus I'm glad to have it. Maybe I'll read to you a poem later for a separate video. Should do a spotlight on him because he is awesome. And so that one, you know, obviously is meaningful for me because it reminds me of my first like entrance into the Strand, which was really, really stressful because we went there like, I think like the day before, it was either New Year's Eve or the like day before New Year's Eve and for some reason it was like slammed like there were people everywhere we hid in the stacks where they have like the used fiction not like in the front area because it was just so overwhelming and there were people everywhere um, and I probably stressed about books more than I should have <laughs> and then the other 
one book that I wanted to talk about is The People of Paper by, by Salvador Placencia. And this book I got in McNally's, which is a much calmer bookstore than The Strand. But they have like a lovely little cafe and they have a really good selection of books and poetry as well. And I just remember going in there and it had been a long day and it was pre-ice cream because ice cream re-energizes. <laughs> um, and just like looking in the stacks, like not knowing what I wanted and the title of this just really appealed to me the people of paper and then like the cover looked really wonderful and then the back which I'll probably read to you because I want to really appealed to me and so I went and I got it and then when I went to go check it out or to check out the um kind uh, sir who was checking me out was like, oh, have you read this? I've heard really good things about it. I haven't read it yet. I was like, oh no, I just saw it on the on the shelves and you know, it appealed to me, and so that was like really positive reception. Plus, it was the first time when I was checking out books that a bookseller actually talked to me. I don't know, the people at the strand didn't feel like talking to me, probably because I was buying way too many books, and they were just like, she's crazy, get her out of my store. No, <laughs> that's just my subconscious. But anyway, I really enjoyed that interaction. It made me feel calm, so that was good. <laughs> So let me read to you the back of this one as well because I haven't mentioned it on my channel and it is a really good book and Caitlin read it first. Let's see if we can see this. See guys, it's from your book pocket. That's from my book pocket. I lied because I was reading it on the subway. <laughs> She's in the room. I was going to see if she was paying attention. She was. Um, I have a book pocket in my jacket. It's my special book pocket jacket. Book, book jacket pocket. Anyway, and it got hurt. I need like a little book slip for my book pocket. Yeah. Anyway, back to the topic. Federico de la Fe is a devoted husband and father, but when his lime-loving wife, Merced, abandons him, he and his little daughter, little Merced, who also loves limes, must start a new life together. They leave their home in Mexico and head for California. There, there they settle among a community of flower pickers where Federico de la Fe's sadness festers and little Messer develops a dangerous addiction to limes. All the while, an oppressive force bears down on the town. When the identity of this mysterious oppressor is finally revealed, the story takes an unexpected turn and moves towards this magical, breathtaking end. A mesmerizing debut about the anguish of lost love, the people of paper marks the arrival of an incredibly talented new writer. And I remember I read, I'm going to start it over again, but I read like the first, maybe like 30 pages and I really, really liked it. Um, lots of magical realism, which is what I like. Anywho, that, my friends, was the time and place tag. I hope that it wasn't too crazy. I'll link all these books down below because I know for a lot of them I didn't even talk about what they were except the ones I got really excited about. Um, so hopefully this wasn't a waste of your time. You learned a little bit about me. And yeah, if you haven't done the time and place tag, I definitely would love to see it from you guys. Like, tell me if you've done it down below. Um, Monica, if you haven't done this, please <laughs> do the time and place tag. Um, yeah, so I will probably see you guys tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to film yet, but I'm going to film something. <laughs>